John could not have possibly known what God had laid on my heart to speak today when he sang songs about the river, he sang songs about the rock, and he sang songs about the way. And we're going to speak about those three things today. I'm going to take us way back to the Old Testament where in the chapters Joshua 2 and 3 and 4 we're looking at problems that they were facing number one God spoke to Joshua Moses my servant is dead now this was the one that had delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt bondage. He'd been there through the wilderness 40 years with them, was their leader. And then, before he died, and he knew the day of his death and told them, he asked God to give him a leader. These people were not to be sheep without a shepherd. They needed somebody that they could see. They had the tangible presence and power of God. They had the temple of God. They had the priests of God. They had the cloud of his presence. They had manna every day that they didn't have to work for. They just got out of their tents and gathered it up. And it was so much that the sun had to come and melt it after they had taken all that they could use for themselves and their family. There was always in the Old Testament and a better covenant in the New that it was always more than enough. God didn't care about all that manna being wasted because there would be fresh new supply the next day. They just had to go out and gather what God had provided for them. In the Psalms it said it was angels' food. So they had the manna. They had water out of a rock. And that rock was Jesus Christ, but they didn't know it was a picture of the rock. It was a picture of the bread of life, the bread from heaven. That's what the Bible said it was. Yes. And they called it manna, but it was just to depict the bread of life. Jesus said it was that true bread that came from heaven. So that was also that picture of the healing, because healing is the children's bread. And this new morning by morning, the Bible says, great is his faithfulness. So here they are, they had a cloud of his presence by day that saved them from the blasting desert heat. And a fire by night that gave them light and kept them warm. And free food every day. All they had to do was follow the cloud. All they had to do was follow the fire if that's what it was, but God always led his people. He always provided for them. He always kept them safe. He always gave them everything that they needed and more than enough. But they also had a physical deliverer that they could see. They had Moses that led them out of bondage, led them through the Red Sea, and led them all the way up to the brink of the promised land. And the people rebelled against the word of God and murmured and complained again and again. And this time God said, all right, everybody that's 20 years old and on up, they're never going to go into the promised land, except for Joshua and Caleb, which was way older than 20 years old. And Moses was 120 when he died. And so anybody that was the oldest under him, other than Joshua and Caleb, guess how old they were? That's how old they were. You take 20 years old or 19 and you add 40 years onto it. The young, the oldest person other than Joshua and Caleb was half of his 
lifetime, 59 years old, was the oldest person when Moses died, except for Joshua and Caleb. So at this time, it was very, very perilous for them that were going to lose their fearless leader. So they had another leader that God had ordained, and that was Joshua. And guess what? He had to have been a whole lot older than 59. In fact, Caleb said, when I explored the promised land as a spy, I was 40 years old when that happened. And so you add 40 years to that, he was 80 years old, and his counterpart was Joshua's son, was probably 80 years old when he led the people into the promised land. And the very oldest son of him was 59 years old. So can you just imagine all the generations in between that had died because they didn't believe the word of God. But God kept his word and said, the next generation is going to go in. So they were on the brink of the promised land and Moses was gone. And God said, I'm going to do something in the eyes of this generation. I'm going to pretty much duplicate what I did when they were following Moses. They were very much at the brink of disaster, not just the brink of the Red Sea. When God parted the Red Sea, enemies were chasing after them. They couldn't go to the right, they couldn't go to the left. Garrison's on the right, rough terrain on the left. I may have that backwards, but it doesn't matter one way or the other, the way you're looking at it. So your left is my right, my right to your left. Whatever, they had no place to go. They couldn't go back, the enemy was pursuing them. They couldn't go forward, the Red Sea was there. They couldn't go to the left or the right. They were trapped and bled into high heaven. Even though they had gone out of Egypt with a high hand, they had gone to the houses and got silver and gold and shoes and clothes and anything they wanted from the Egyptians and spoiled them. They went out with a high hand, the Bible says, and not one feeble one remained among them. That's the word of God. There was a mass of healing because there wasn't one feeble person. God healed them all. And here they are, leaving that country, trapped. And God did a miracle, part of the Red Sea. And then after they were safely on the other side, what happened? The enemy was pursuing them and that Red Sea, chasing hard after them. God looked down, chariot wheels come off. God just played with them, you know? He laughed at the enemy because he had a plan for his people. The plan was to part the Red Sea. They would go on dry ground. The enemy thought, we'll do the same thing. We'll just go on this same Red Sea and pursue them. And we'll take them back as slaves or kill them, annihilate them. Whatever we want to do with them, we'll get all our stuff back. That didn't happen because as soon as they were safely on the other side, we know that the Red Sea was no longer dry. All of the forces came back and drowned all the enemy. It didn't help them. So that was a generation before. And we have heard the testimonies of other people in other generations. Now we know the history, we know the stories, we know the miracles, we know the things that God had done for them because we have it in our ears. But what we need is experience for ourselves. Is that a good deal? To experience the power of God in our own lives and in our own generation, regardless of what he did in our grandparents' generation or our parents' generation, we need God to move in our lives and our situations. And so God said, I'm going to do something that's going to change the hearts of these people going from non-believers to believers, going from perhaps wondering if you should be a fearless leader because Moses was gone. I'm going to do something great so they'll never forget it. What he did was he duplicated a miracle. Here they are. They're facing the overflow 
of the Jordan, that separated them, the wilderness, from the promised land. And it was that flood stage. Come on, they didn't have a raft. They didn't have a boat. They had millions of people that were here but needed to be there because this time they were actually wanting to go into the promised land. They were not going to rebel because they saw what happened 40 years more in the wilderness. We don't want to be cut off at the age of 59 on down to the eggs and arms, or we don't want to give up the promises of God. We waited all these years, some of them 40 long years, some were born in the wilderness during that time. So they didn't know. They didn't have that experience of seeing the Red Sea part. They didn't realize it, but they knew about the manna, they knew about the tabernacle, they knew about the priesthood. They actually saw the fire by night, the cloud by day. They saw the provision of God every day. They were born into it. They were born into the miraculous provision. But they needed to see a miracle that would be performed in their midst, which would be unforgettable. And they could pass this on from generation to generation so that it would be recorded, rehearsed in the ears of those to come. To know that our God reigns, that he is sovereign, that he's in control. He's a God that is above all and everywhere present. Almighty God, no matter how impossible it is, that he still parts the Red Sea, he still parts the Jordan, and it may be your personal one this time, in your generation, in your situation, you're not looking at a has-been, could have been, once upon a time, fairy tale God. Or the Lord that once upon a time walked on the water, or once upon a time stilled the storms, or once a time, upon a time, provided manna in the wilderness and water out of a rock. Or once upon a time, he parted the Red Sea just on time to get his people over. And then when the waters came back, it destroyed the enemies. He said, those that you see now, your enemies that are pursuing you are dogging your tracks to destroy you. To enslave you, to embarrass you, to cut you down, to rob you, to kill you, you're not going to see him anymore. How many know that God is an on time God for our generation? So, Joshua, so many years older than the oldest of them, had to be. 80 years old, or very close to it. Close to the age of Caleb, which was 80 years old at that time, because later on, after five years of war, he said, give me this land. I was 40 years old when I explored it. Now I'm 85. Give me this mountain, this my inheritance. I'm strong and able to subdue the enemy. So you know that his counterpart had to be 80 years old, too when they were at the brink of the Jordan. So people still had an aged person to lead them, not nearly as old as Moses. No, not at all. But still, he had that experience. He had fought wars. He knew what God had done. He had been there when they crossed the Red Sea. He had been there through all the things that they faced in the wilderness. He'd been there when they constructed the temple, when God gave them the design. He was there when they had made the golden calf. He was there to see the plans of the wrath of God. There to see the earth open up and swallow those that rebelled against God. He was there to see the wrath of God come off the altar of God and destroy 250 of the renowned leaders because they rebelled against Moses and his servant as the priest, Aaron. He was there to see all that. And so he was definitely a testimony 
of the goodness of God, of the power of God, and knowing that we want him on our side. Isn't it a really good thing to be on his side? We want him on our side, but it's really good for us to stay in that place where we know that we're on his side. See, there is the side of right. There is the side of wrong. And it is not true that that fence exists. We make a decision every day whether we're going to serve God or not. Whether we're going to be on his side or not. Whether we're going to be on the way, the truth, the life, the light side, or the dark side. In the world, love the world, or being in the world to be light. That's what we decide every day. So here he is. He hadn't done this before. Joshua always had. He was a servant. He was a servant of Moses, but he did everything he was told to do. He saw everything. He, he was there when God wrote the Ten Commandments on the stones. He was there, saw all of that, heard all of that, experienced all that with Moses. Saw that the second time. So now the responsibility is on his shoulders. And God said, I'm going to do something that's going to make you renowned. The people will always fear you like they did Moses. And as I was with Moses, by the way, I'm going to be with you. But also he was going to perform something in the eyes of the little ones and the older ones, the ones that knew and the ones that never knew. Because they were pretty young when God said, hey, I'm going to destroy all these people and you're going to go into the promised land. So the oldest one would have been 19 at the time that would be able to remember the rebellion against God. And they weren't going to do that again. We want to go into the promised land. But then here it is. We're on this side. The promised land is over there. And it's not a really good time to be going into the promised land. We know that God promised it. It's going to be a great, wonderful inheritance for us. But we're stuck on this side, and it's that flood season. This is an impossible thing. Why would God bring us up to the brink of our miracle and we face the impossibility of crossing over on the other side? How many of you are facing impossibilities in your life and it couldn't be at a worse time? 